This is a good book. <laughs> the Heart of History, Individuality and Evolution by John Ware Perry. Chapter 1. The Psyche and the Evolution of Cultures. We find ourselves today in a critical predicament of modern culture, faced with an urgent need to reassess our relation to the planet and to those who inhabit it. It is not only the inclination, but the obligation of honor the alternatives ahead to speak from our various fields of experience and expertise, offering whatever may be of relevance in groping our way into our future full of forebodings. Since I have busied myself during the past three decades in dealing with individuals in turmoil and crisis, observing the psyche in its developmental process, trying out solutions to problems, and investigating in the history of cultures various parallels to these inner processes, I have found certain patterns which I feel to be relevant to our efforts to handle our dilemma. Our Cultural Predicament and the Psyche's Response in the technological age that has been developing and refining its methods so dramatically over the past five centuries, our principal mode of investigating nature has been governed by the drive to mastery and power over it, to learn its laws in order to be able to control it and wrest from it what we need for our use. It is easy for us to feel a sense of triumph and pride in the success of the endeavors, in the miracles that have been accomplished, and thus to assume that the human condition has never been so well off. Yet when we stand back and allow the complete picture to come to consciousness, we discover to our dismay its other, darker aspect. We recognize that we are not only exhausting the Earth's resources by the efficacy with which we extract and spend them, but even depleting the life forms that inhabit this world with us. On top of all that, we find ourselves endangering the various matrices in which these life forms exist poisoning the atmosphere, the water, and the soil itself. While all this progress is intended to benefit human life, we are so effective in preserving that life from disease and death, supporting it in numbers heretofore undreamed of, that we may well exceed the possibility of sustaining so many billions of human beings on so small a world. As populations rise, so does competitiveness with each other to attain the rich benefits that present themselves so attractively. We are learning to our bewilderment that as the crowding mounts, the order in our society crumbles. We are becoming frightened of each other within our cities and among our nations. The facts are familiar to all of us, spelling a crisis in our worldwide technologically oriented culture. The flowering of our achievements is so wondrous and the triumph so brilliant that we find it easy to lull ourselves into complacent confidence that there is nothing we cannot remedy and to relegate the sense of uneasiness to a shadowy unconsciousness. Yet even if we may fail to acknowledge our predicament in a conscious way, the psyche does register its recognition of it on deeper levels and makes moves to generate new possibilities of outlook and ways of living that might allow our survival. A new look at visionary states. I have made it my special task during the past three decades and more to watch these deepest operations of the psyche when they are intensely activated, that is, in the visionary states that so often find psychotic form. In these disruptive turmoils, one finds frequently a myth-forming activity that gives rise to vivid imagery with regularly recurring features. In light of my training, I had expected that in a person's deep regression to early experience, the personal problems of parent and sibling relationships would predominate and fill the field with the turbulent emotions surrounding early hurts. But surprisingly, the play of themes and the chaotic images and emotions most often concerned itself instead with the pressing questions of cultural ideologies. The most urgent collective issues of society in any decade were felt fully as deeply as those that sprang from an individual's life story. In the 50s, the clash of democracies and communism, and in the 70s, the conflicts between those who are polluting the planet and those who work for ecological concerns. The fear of destruction of the planet at the hands of wrongly motivated agencies prevailed, usually with the terror of the nuclear blast woven throughout these misgivings. These individuals impressed me as being souls so sensitive to the climate of the times that they were overwhelmed by the magnitude of the collective plight. As a result, Colorful messianic ideations would arise. 
Such imagery is easy for a therapist to dismiss because of its grandiosity and its transparent compensation for feelings of inadequacy. Yet, if taken seriously, it can be found to be highly significant in revealing an awareness of the cultural predicament and in envisioning programs of reform. Listening to the visionary experiences in which these persons were engrossed at the expense of their relation to the everyday mundane reality raised for me a host of puzzling questions. They were obviously undergoing a process of reorganization in which an old form of the self was being outgrown and supplanted by a renewed form, but the means of accomplishing this were surprising. Themes of death and rebirth ran parallel with those of world destruction and world regeneration. Time was set back at the beginning of one's own life in parallel with those of the creation. The place was identified as the world center. Clashes of political and moral forces were portrayed on a cosmic scale, and opposites of all sorts were brought into collision. Reversal into each other, and finally into union. Expressions of worldwide mission of leadership and reform reach exalted dimensions. Learning from myth and ritual parallels. What I wondered, do all these eruptions of cosmic ideation have to do with the recognition of one's psyche and its efforts to bring it to maturity? If all this sequence is a myth-making process, what are the mythic parallels from history that might be found to give some orientation to the meaning? Some years went by before I encountered what I was seeking. On reading Murcia Iliadi's brilliant book, The Myth of the Eternal Return, I was electrified to see it all laid out in full. All the elements of the process and ancient ritual practices of the Near East, from this start, I was led into extensive reading in the myth and ritual forms of the first city cultures of that part of the world in its urban revolution of 5,000 to 3,000 years ago. Exploring these ceremonial forms has led me to recognize the function of myth and ritual in the efforts of cultures to weather the turmoils and crises of the profound changes in their transitions from one kind of structural organization and economy to a new one. For example, from an agrarian and clan form to a city one of the Bronze Age. Specifically, the function of the sacral kingship is found to be the principal key to an understanding of the great religions of antiquity all over the newly urbanized world. I was reminded of an encounter while I was a medical student with Professor Mercher, a leading Egyptologist. To my grasping at this opportunity to learn something of mythology, he responded with the statement, you won't understand Egyptian mythology without a knowledge of the practices of kingship there. From my newly acquired exposure to Jung's writings, I thought, oh, too bad he doesn't appreciate the psychology of mythic imagery of the unconscious. It took me 15 years to realize how dead wrong I was, for by then I was finding that, indeed, all the great religions of that ancient world were concerned primarily with the sacral kingship and government. The myth and ritual sequence was uncannily similar to what I was seeing in my patients. In Mesopotamia, for example, the annual New Year festival was a re enthronement rite for renewal of the king and the kingdom. Symbolically, the place was the center of the world, the time, that of the creation. The king was then re enthroned as ruler of the universe, and a festive banquet was followed by the rite of the sacred marriage in a booth of greenery atop the stage tower, representing the union of heaven and earth and other opposites, to reinvigorate the land, its people, and the livestock and crops. Finally, the will of the gods of the society's near future was divine in a reading of the tablets of destiny. How can it be, I reflected, that these ritual programs of antiquity can reappear in the psyche of peoples today with such faithfulness to the pattern? The patriarchal ceremonial government and its theology were new at the time of the urban revolution. Has this mythic imagery been coded into our inherent psychic repertory ever since as the basic pattern of reorganizational and renewal processes in times of stress? Even more intriguing to me was a further question arising out of these. I had been observing that there was a trend in the content of my patients' visionary experiences during the several weeks of their process. They typically started with grossly grandiose claims to unusual power and prestige as heroes and heroines saviors of the people, even rulers are divinities with cosmic powers. Gradually, the emphasis shifted from such power concerns to a new awareness of their capacities for loving relatedness, and their messianic program for reform was colored by a preoccupation with compassion, lovingness, and brotherhood. This seemed to me to imply that such persons were starting in their visionary turmoil with an orientation to their world that was consonant with the bias of our culture toward prestige, power, or control.
a way of life that was reflected in their personal conditioning. This prevailing psychic dynamic was then being led from an active, directive, dominative mode toward one which concerned itself with sensitive relating, empathy, and receptiveness. The goal of reorganizing the self in this process, therefore, seemed to be that of engendering not only their own capacities for intimate relationship, but also of envisioning a culture in which these values would predominate. This suggested the picture of the psyche in myriad individuals occasionally undergoing by their unconscious process in dream and fantasy. This transformation of values and motivations, one that is the very urgent task of the collective culture. After all, the culture as a whole cannot accomplish this change unless the persons composing it do so. Is not this cultural change an aggregate of individual changes? I was aware that a similar shift in values occurred in some ancient cultures on the heels of the initial enthusiasm for power and the dominance in the early urban revolution, and so I wondered whether the sacral kingship ideology could also have been the vehicle for this transformation of values towards those of brotherhood and compassion. Cultural Functions of Myth and Ritual These questions were leading me toward an inescapable conclusion that myth and ritual not only gave expression to what is occurring in the deep levels of the psyche at any time, but they also function to guide the emotional energies of societies into new channels required by changing conditions, such as those of an urban culture as it emerges out of the village life that preceded it, in the transition from an agrarian economy to a Bronze Age. Myth, in this case, gives form and expression to the meaning of the powerful realities of human experience in times of reorientation and culture change. The accompanying ritual provides the means to transform and channel emotional and motivational energies into new directions. It was becoming clear that wherever cultural forms are due for an overhauling, the inevitable distress of bewilderment tends to be resolved by the revelation of new meaning through the medium of myth. The ideology of the sacral kingship is going to provide a main thread in the gradual unfolding of the evolution of the psyche as I trace it out to answer the questions being raised in this review of the initial observations that motivated my investigation of cultural histories. Making so much of the sacral kingship might seem curious since several widely read scholars have presented it in the light of grandiosity and tyranny on the part of arrogant bullies who use their power to oppress the people, or worse, who are the proponents of a fatal step in the direction of the patriarchy from which we are at last struggling to free ourselves. Such vilification misses the essential point, however. What is most significant about the Sacral Kings and the evolutionary perspective is that they embody the psychic image representing the full potential of unique individuality and its nascents, awaiting its realization eventually among the many. In early China, as we shall observe, he was called the Unique Man. In early Egypt, the only man whose immortal soul could be transfigured in death, and in early Mesopotamia, his title of Lugol connoted the superior man. With the kingship too, a new member of the male pantheon came into being in the Near East, the Storm or Warrior God. As King God, he personified the mythic image of a new species of consciousness, one that was motivated toward ambition for ever-increasing power, dominance, and mastery. In the case of rulers creating ever new worlds of angredized kingdoms and empires theretofore undreamed of. In the case of the common citizen singling himself out from the common social matrix and building his own personal empire of property and prestige. All too soon, however, this new individuality showed itself to be seriously problematic. The prerogative of kings was coveted and then mimicked by the aristocracy and thus diffused out from the strong central monarchy into the hands of petty princes and barons. In Egypt and in China, most notably, the firm order of the reign from the center gave way to a multiplicity of competing local governments in a feudal scattering of power. The sacrality of the governing office dropped away, and with secularizations came also a loss of the sense of productive responsibility toward the people who, no longer finding their lord a benign father, found themselves instead being oppressed and plundered amid the shifting fortunes of war makers. Out of these anguishing times of troubles, to use Toynbee's term, there appeared manifestations of reform that have impressed me as remarkable demonstrations of the capacity of the human psyche to respond to crises with creative visions of its healing potentials. 
or the ceremonial forms of the sacral kingships I found subsequently underwent a sequence of metamorphoses from era to era, representing not only the maturation of cultures, but at the same time the differentiation of the human psyche. The changes in this developmental sequence were the outcome of the work of visionary insights on the part of reformers, prophets, and seers, giving direct voice to the myth-making work of the deep levels of the psyche. It was astounding to me to discover how clearly, in their new teaching, it was indicated that while the actual rulership was becoming secularized, the sacred royal figure was being internalized, that is, what he had represented in ceremony was increasingly being perceived as happening within the individual member of the society. The familiar ritual forms now were becoming the symbolic language of inner psychic and spiritual processes. It thus was evident to me that this functioning of the mythic image of the kingship is what we still see today in the dreams and visionary experiences of individuals. The Thrust of Evolution The thrust of evolution through the history that I was exploring could therefore be construed as starting with the outwardly concretized myth and ritual forms of collective expression, and moving then toward inwardly realized images coming into play in individual spiritual cultivation. This internalization was at the same time recognizable as a democratization of the kingly forms, as I have called it. This produced a remarkable transformation of values. The royal ideology had begun with such a high esteem for the new scale of power, dominance, and empire building that these motivations were sacralized. With the democratization, on the other hand, the supremacy of these values yielded place to newly conceived spiritual ideals of compassion, brotherhood, and personal piety, that is, the bonding and cohesion of society, at first imposed upon the people in the modes of power and dominance, became now recognized as springing from the capacities of individuals for compassion and mutual caring. In many cultures, the earlier image of the kingdom as a corporate entity embodied the person of the sacral king gave way to the concept of the inner kingdom of the spirit, in which social cohesion would take place instead through the development of the sense of oneness with one's fellow beings. Along with this, the awareness of moral responsibility that had at first been carried solely by the king then became a task for the individual to realize. I was struck by the observation that the advances of this evolution were in each culture born out of turmoil and crisis, out of the stress and strain of change, and the peril, bewilderment, and demoralization in the face of uncertain futures. This presented a powerful picture of the role of the visionary mind as one of mankind's most potent adaptive functions, active typically in situations of puzzlement in times of transition. The social order and organization at first projected out in the myth and ritual practices of the governing figure had a symbolic shape. The king was located symbolically at the cosmic axis or world center and characteristically surrounded by a city-state that was constructed in the form of a quadrate circle, a mandala, as the pattern replicating the shape of the world or cosmos. With the democratization of the kingly forms, the center was now to be found within. The mandala now the shape of the soul when it accomplishes its wholeness, and above all, rule now appearing as self-government, that is, psychic integration. The mythic processes of death and rebirth, world destruction and world creation, the clashes of opposing forces and their resolution, the establishing of renewed order in society and the generating of life-giving powers, all the work of the earlier annual ceremonial process of renewal now became recognized as the various aspects of the spiritual task of self-cultivation. Each of these elements that had been perceived as applying to the societal world now could be seen as representing one's relation to one's cultural world and also to one's psychic world. This history then suggests that the ordering of a society starts with a reorganizational process expressed in the psyche's symbolic imagery, whether in myth and ritual or in the corresponding intuitive mode of thinking. As a culture outgrows its past state and enters a new one, the reconstructing thrust represents a healing in terms of self-organizing process, just as it happens also in the individual organism. In this framework, we can recognize the pattern of the evolutionary process in the development of the psyche and of the cultures it creates. This evolutionary process can be clearly traced through the differentiation of psychic potentials expressed in mythic imagery, and specifically through the development of mankind's relation to the image of the center.
This archetypal center, to use Jung's language, is the source of each of the steps in psychological growth as the mainspring and governing function of the psychic organism's experience. The cultural studies in part two are explorations of the major turning points in four ancient cultures from which I draw the conclusions I am speaking of, ones in which there appeared the earliest dawning realizations of the possibilities in the mode of human-hearted compassionship for the ordering of whole societies as they democratize the kingship. Added to these are investigations of the romantic reiterations of these motifs in the 12th and 19th centuries. What led to these investigations? My motivation in undertaking this exploration began a long time ago, exactly 50 years ago, even in the same season of the year in which I am writing this. I spent the months of summer vacation re-examining my beliefs and my understanding of the part we play in creation. I was aware that classical philosophies have consistently had their footing in cosmology and cosmogony, so I began there, reviewing the current sciences of various sorts to help understand the question of where we have come from and where are we going in the creative process. At the end of a few months, what I was looking for came through to me in a highly exhilarating moment. Out under the dome of a starry sky where I was reviewing these reflections, I was filled with a sense of wonderment at the grand panorama of the creative process. Building upon itself layer by layer, atoms combining into molecules, these clusterings to form living unicellular creatures and cells joining cooperatively to construct the tissues of ever more complex organisms. The question pressing itself all the while was where is it going next? This time, in one of those transports that Maslow has described as peak experiences, I perceived that the thrust of evolution toward higher levels of order and complexity was now pointing toward its next phase, the creation of a new superorganism. I saw that if the highest achievement of this creative process so far has been the extraordinary configuration of energies that form mankind's consciousness, then surely the next step is that of bringing together these individual psyches into an organic whole, which I saw as a social organism. Of course, today this is not new, since the publication in the 1950s of Tallard de Cardin's beautiful rendition of the cosmic process and formulation of the new sphere, but in 1934 there was nothing in any literature that I knew of that spoke this way. The gift of this vision of creation I not only treasured, I found it in my vocation. This was to explore the dynamics of social and psychic evolution, and I hoped to reach some comprehension of how it could be that society might become increasingly such an organism whose members live cooperatively for the well-being of the whole. My question was that if this is indeed our evolution's next level of order and complexity, where in the human psyche would the dynamics originate that might motivate individuals toward furthering such a future? I had already the glimmering recognition of some sort of cohesive principle running through and governing the whole process of creation. It came to me that we human beings have the distinction of being endowed with a highly developed consciousness by which we are able to experience this cohesive principle at work and apperceive it as lovingness. It is an example of the observation that through mankind's awareness the universe becomes conscious of itself. At the lower levels of organization and complexity this cohesiveness is only dimly justifiably perceivable, suggesting to me a beautiful vision of the driving force in the evolutionary process. It then made sense to me that in the Christian teaching, God is not only the creator, but also is love, that is, that love is his deity. The goal of my newly found vocation was clear. It was to explore this question. From what source in the psyche does the energy derive that motivates individuals towards this kind of lovingness that might make a human society an organism? Clearly, on this level, such a body has transcendent laws governing biological nature, though including them, and instead is psychic in its makeup. Therefore, for me, it was clear that an understanding of the psyche must provide a vehicle for exploring the nature of the superorganism. At first, I wondered whether the Freudian psychology would give the right lead, that is, whether the sexual libido goes through various sublimations and differentiations to serve at last the purposes of human-hearted caring and fellowship in society. I could see that searching into the function of myth and ritual and their present-day counterparts in depth psychology would be the avenue to pursue.
When I set out with these aims in the 1930s, the habits of thought concerning myth were different than those of today. The exciting revelations were reductive in character. Fraser's golden bow in exploring the archaic manifestation of king killing and of the death and rebirth process as expressions of the vegetational and seasonal round of the life-giving cycle promise to account for similar themes in the higher cultures and religions. One might then be tempted to explain the Christian crucifixion in terms of the motif of the dying gods, such as Tammuz of the earlier Mesopotamian myths and rituals. Solomon Reinach, in his Orpheus, accounted for the nature of the gods of the pantheon of antiquity by their animal forms in which he found them to have their origins. Lord Raglan, head of the British Royal Anthropological Society in The Hero, made a painstaking comparative study of that motif as a demonstration of the diffusionist frame of thought that finds the occurrence of myth forms to be due to their spread from culture to culture, following the lead given by Elliot Smith and W.J. Perry earlier. Raglan, in Jocosta's crime, was bold enough to go the limit and set up a hypothetical scenario of a supposed first original ritual form that was then the source in remotest prehistory of all the later variations and permutations of myths of the hero that followed. After all, in the casual reductive framework, there has to be a starting point. This was the climate of thought in which Freud and his Moses and monotheism conceived the notion of a first guilty act that could then survive in human experience as an archaic heritage, reappearing in each succeeding generation as the proclivity towards suffering guilt in the Oedipus constellation of parent-child triangles. The first supposed act was the murder of the father by the sons in the primal horde of the remotest past. These efforts to establish first causes would be far more justifiable if presented as myths to account for mythology rather than as scientific propositions. If a problem is fraught with mystery because of its obscurity, then the mythic image is always ready at hand to provide an orientation and approach toward clarity. In those years, I found Jung's escape from such causal reductive pitfalls truly exhilarating. His early essay on psychological understanding was a clear-headed and titanic declaration of an alternative to causal thinking. In it, he pointed out that such investigations into past occurrences rendered only half the picture of what a dream or myth contains. The other part is provided by what he called a synthetic constructive standpoint that looks for that with which the imagery is trying to experiment in probing into future possibilities and potentials. Herein is brought to light the creative work of the primordial images and their culture-making proclivities. In this view, the deep psyche is the wellspring of creativity. Looked at in this spirit, for example, the Arthurian mythology is explained in part, perhaps, by the exploration of the origin of its heroes and ancient Celtic gods of Ireland and Wales. Yet, the true significance of the tales and the source of the fervor with which they proliferated when they did are to be found rather in their relevance to the new culture of the 12th century in Angevin, France. In respect to evolutionary theory, I was struck with a similar contrast between reductionist thinking and the new trends. Darwin's Descent of Man had dealt a blow to the concept of humanity, so ennobled in the phrasing of the Psalms as a little lower than the angels, now picturing the human as a little higher than the apes from which he was descended. The theory of the survival of the fittest was having a similar impact on social and economic motives to justify man's crudest strivings towards competition and dominance. It was therefore exhilarating once more to encounter Henry Drummond's Ascent of Man, in which he compensated this trend toward degrading the role of the spiritual in mankind striving. In this and in his natural law in the spiritual world, he rendered the first glimmerings of the principle governing the direction of evolutionary development in the increasingly ascending levels of order and complexity. He perceived, too, that the laws operating at any higher level were not reducible to those of the lower I found this to be close to Jung's synthetic constructive standpoint. I enjoyed the privilege of attending classes given by A. N. Whitehead and Al. J. Henderson, both of which were like launching pads into new dimensions of cosmological perspectives. Henderson explicated the model of the ascending order of complexity organization, illustrating it with his box spring metaphor for the interrelation of factors in blood chemistry. A change in any part of the whole system affects all the others. A vivid introduction to the principles of systems as against the linear account of separate entities. To listen to Whitehead was to have one's mind stretched and open to the new outlook of today.
recognizing process as the fashioner of form, in a framework of sequences in time and envelopes in space, in a cosmos in which every monad is interrelated with and reflects the nature of the whole. A particular delight was an encounter with Joseph Needham on a rain-soaked monsoon day by the Burma Road in China in the mid-1940s. He put in my hands the galley proofs of his Time, the Refreshing River, a work on evolution, and we compared notes on our quest after an understanding of the social organism as the crowning phase of evolution, and the role of love as the bonding principle running through this process. He had recently outgrown his allegiance with the mechanistic view of biological and human nature, and was gathering materials for his monumental Science and Civilization in China, a variable summa scientifica of Far Eastern thought in which he found a worldview that gave an ideal framework for evolutionary thinking. Through these several fortunate encounters, I was reassured that I was on the right path in my pursuit of an understanding of evolution by investigating it at a close range in psychological work. Since then, circumstances have followed one upon another in a way to keep me remarkably on track in the pursuit of this quest, even though I would not have been able to foresee the plan ahead of time. Upon my return from training in analytical psychology in Zurich, I was assigned a case that by good fortune opened up the entirely new recognition of the self-healing process in acute psychosis. This was surprising enough to send me into an investigation of such acute disturbances for a decade, finding in them an open window into the spontaneous myth-making process of reorganizing the self. Discovering the myth and ritual parallels in the sacral kingships soon provided the recognition of the image sequence I have termed the renewal process. All this opened two avenues to explore which have occupied me for the past 25 years. One came out of an appalling recognition of the damage done to persons in acute episodes by our treatment of them in suppressing the natural self-healing work of the psyche. Seeing this so clearly led me into several efforts to provide methods to handle cases of this kind in such a way as to give the psyche full freedom to attain its own ends in its own modes. They were beautiful and rewarding experiences which were possible in the 1970s and unfortunately now have become unrealizable in the conditions of cautious conservatism of the 1980s. The other avenue arose out of a realization that the myth and ritual I was writing about were expressions of self-reorganizing processes by which whole cultures were embarking upon new futures. Reform of revolutionary proportions was again and again turning out to be the work of visionaries. It began to come through to me that in our time, we are at a point of transition of critical proportions, needing our own new myth to express the still unfamiliar future as we stand upon its threshold. With these considerations, a host of questions presented themselves about our psychological and psychiatric outlook, with its preoccupation with the rational and the normal. Do we have ways of reorganizing our new myth if and when it appears? What are we doing with our visionaries? How many of them are we labeling psychotic and putting away in confinement under medication, or relegating to poverty as eccentric artists, or curing other symptoms by therapy? Composing this exploration by this very circuitous route, through many years and many issues to investigate, I have found myself encountering more and more the original objective of my calling, to gain an understanding of human evolution. The several psychiatric and scholarly concerns and endeavors that have led me along this path have each time been expressions of the main aim. When the time finally arrived for the task of laying out and writing all that had been coming to light in these explorations, I found myself in no small quandary. There seemed to be several histories to recount. One was the metamorphosis of the sacral kingship expressing the differentiation of the image of the center. Another, the role of visionary states in culture making. Again, another, the phenomenology of rapid culture change and its psychological consequences. Then there were the ways lovingness has been seen as a means of social bonding. There was the problem of our present cultural transition and its demands to avoid disaster. And all the while, there was the task of relating psychic evolution to its biological counterpart. Each of these issues seemed to deserve a full treatment in its own separate book. I sketched out one on kingship, one on visionary states, and one on acute culture change. Yet with each, its thesis clearly necessitated some introduction of the other motifs, since all were so interdependent as to be unclear without one another. The present volume, therefore, is about all of these issues, 
as it began to emerge into its present shape. My image was one of holding half a dozen strands requiring an intricate interweaving. My hope is that in the form of this single, compact book, the themes may be clear and not taxing to read, and their interrelating already accomplished. The design of this exploration. The design of this exploration begins, then, with some observations from the psychological anthropologist concerning the crises of rapid culture change out of which myth and ritual are born through visionary experiences. There follows a discussion focusing upon a predominant element of such visions, that of the motif of world images and world regeneration as a core feature of the renewal process occurring either on the societal or the individual level. Concentrating further again on what is placed at the center of such world images, in part two, the myth and ritual role of the sacral kingship is revived in a number of cultural forms. These are selected to bring into relief the striking transformations of this myth form when it was found to belong to mankind's inner psychic life as well as to its outer societal structure. Each example demonstrates how it was that out of this internalization was born the democracy expressing the new awareness of individuality and personal sense of responsibility for the welfare of one's society. The kernel of this achievement of spiritual awareness emerged clearly as the realization, new to mankind at the time, that the emotions of lovingness could operate as the inner dynamic of social cohesion. The last of these examples shows that in the poetry of Shelley, all these developmental trends were brought into play in his myth forms, ones that could have their ritual accompaniment in political action in a nonviolent mode, eventually to be carried out in actual practice a century later by Gandhi. The selection of the historical materials to be investigated might be questioned when it is found that I have omitted certain cultures and their ways of thought about democracy and the emotions of involved societal cohesion. For example, the mythology of Greece and the dialogues of Plato are not brought into the discussion because the metamorphosis of the kingship there became lost in historical obscurity and did not lead over clearly into its internalization. For the same reason, Gnosticism also has not been included in this study of visionary material, even though it is replete with it. My intention has been to cleave only to the framework provided by the evolution of the imagery of kingship of the center it personifies and of its subsequent democratization. The final chapters in part three offer some psychological comments. They hold always to the spirit of the myth and ritual imagery itself in order not to do violence to its nature, which is sufficiently eloquent to render its own meaning in terms of human experience. I am intentionally avoiding interpreting the myth forms into psychological language until these final chapters. A myth speaks for itself and conveys its own meaning most clearly the nearer one is to the style of mentality of the culture that gave rise to it. If I am reading a primitive South Sea Island people's tale about the witchery grub, I find myself unmoved. It takes a little time to love the Native American trickster, Coyote, but the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh suffers passions about friendship, death, and the wiles of the goddess with which we can all empathize without hesitation. Myth requires a mental process that Jung calls amplification for its understanding, meaning simply that the more one is familiar with the language of symbolization, the more clearly the significance comes through. Amplification is essentially a means of enriching our conscious associations to these motifs in order to be able to resonate to them with the sense of comprehension. If we pick up a volume of Blake's rather wild and passionately colorful mythic poetry, we may draw a blank at first until we familiarize ourselves with the entire context of this thought and of the cultural setting in which it evolved and to which it was addressed. But with this, we find in it a wondrous critique of his age. I therefore am holding entirely to the phenomenological data of observation when I speak of the center or cosmic axis as a locus in which renewal processes take place in dramatic form, whether in the individual or in the collective dimension, or when I say that it thereby becomes the motif through which the evolution of mankind's differentiation of consciousness becomes traceable. Psychological theory only alerts me to the possibility of the meaningfulness of this motif. It is what prepares me even to think it's valid to expect to grant it such a role in the evolutionary process. In part three, then, the first chapter describes the psychology of individuality and its evolution, emphasizing the role of the archetypal center in this process. The tension between individuality and social sensitivity is brought into focus, conceived in terms of a complementarity 
The lesson of history emerges. The individuality can become so destructive that it requires compensation in the form of a full awareness of the feeling for one's fellow beings. In this, the feminine principle is shown to balance the bias of the patriarchy and the receptive to balance the overly assertive aggressive motivations. This history is then put in the context of some current concepts of evolution and self-organizing systems. There follows a discussion relating these cultural and mythological findings to the parallels of our own day, in which nuclear nemesis threatens us so mortally. Mythic images underlying this emotional crisis are found in several motifs in the thunderbolt representing the explosive weapon, in the end of the known world as a mark of profound culture change, and in the enemy as the projection of our own dark aspect. The rise of the feminine and the receptive mode of experience are seen as our contemporary myth form in the psyche's attempt to compensate our dangerous bias toward dominance and mastery over nations and over nature. The last chapter is an attempt to evaluate these lessons of history in respect to the prospect ahead. Considering the question of separateness created by individuality in balance with the sense of oneness with our fellow beings, gained through the very fulfillment of that individuality, I invite the reader now into the same journey of exploration and discovery that I have been enjoying for the past 25 years.